Hi everyone, this is Mehul Mehta and welcome back to my YouTube channel. So for today's podcast, we have a very special guest. His name is Sheikh Ahmed Ola. So so a quick background about uh, Sheikh is, uh, so uh, Sheikh and I were colleagues uh, at Regions Bank. So Sheikh's, uh, Sheikh works for the model validation group and I was working for the uh, for the quant modeling group. So, and I guess we had a quick coffee chat and after that we are, you know, great colleagues, good friends, and we do share a lot of, you know, uh, understanding about, you know, quantitative finance in general. So for today's podcast or today's session, you know, Sheikh will be walking us through uh, loss forecasting models for C cell and C car. Uh, also uh, uh, telling about his uh, educational background, uh, Sheikh has done PhD and applied mathematics so so he's great with math stat and have a great understanding about quantitative models so first of all uh, I, uh, I want to thank you Sheikh, for joining in today and uh, welcome to this podcast or you can say welcome to this session uh, thank you thank you mehul i i really appreciate you created this platform uh, uh i uh, i appeared in another uh, episode and really enjoyed talking about uh, model validation back then. And uh, recently I saw uh, uh, an episode that you had you know, with uh, 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 Mentis, right, uh, uh, here. So uh, it is really good to see that you're covering CCAR, for, uh, CCAR and stress testing and, and the modeling around that. So I, I thought like uh, the loss forecasting models uh, are kind of part of the stress testing part uh, process. So maybe a continuation of that uh, episode, uh, I can discuss some of the loss forecasting models. Yeah. So, uh, and yes, I do, uh, we had a, a nice uh, uh, time in regions when uh, Mihal was there. Um, I, and uh, when he left, uh, we still um, uh, kept our uh, relationship uh, alive. And uh, I'm, uh, I was really surprised to see uh, the platform he created. And this the, this podcast uh, is uh, only focusing on the modeling and quant finance. So, so I was really get, get, get to, glad to see that. Uh, uh, with that, I'm going to uh, start my uh, uh, presentation. Uh, but before that, uh, I want to hear about also the participants, if they are okay, because uh, I've seen some of you in the in the previous videos watching the Thikar one. So it's, it will be good to know your background and also your names, please, if, if that is okay. Yeah, uh, sure. So if yeah, sure, yeah. yeah, please, 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 all, all of you just give a quick introduction about yourself, you know, maybe in a line and maybe we can start with the session. Give your name and your background. Where are you studying? If you have graduated? Yeah. Uh, hello, sir. I am uh, Yash Khapekar. So I am from University of Texas at Arlington. So I'm doing my master's in quantitative finance and I'm currently in my third semester. Yeah. Nice, nice. <laughs> Hello, hi, uh, this is Bhupesh. Uh, I completed my graduation from Rutgers Business School in from quantitative finance. I graduated in last December and I'm currently working as a quant research assistant over there. So I'm currently working on a value at risk model, how we can perform the stress testing and everything. So I, I'm really looking forward to this session and learning a lot from you. Thank you, thank you. Um, hi, uh, this is Akshay Joshi. So I completed my master's in finance uh, last year from Claremont Graduate University. I'm currently looking for full-time roles in quantitative finance. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Mehul, and hi, everyone. Hi, Saik, thank you for joining us. And I'm Nayan Patel, studying MS in finance at Fordham University and also pursuing the CQF program. And currently, I'm working as a quantitative research intern at the UN Pension Fund in New York. Awesome. Um, hello everyone, this is Shivani. Um, I'm currently in my fourth semester of Master's in Quantitative Finance um, and I'm also a student of University of Texas at Arlington. Um, and yeah, in next May, I'm going to graduate from Con, Con Finance. Hi, Sheikh. Uh, first of all, like, thank you so much you're here that uh, helping us with learning about more about loss forecasting models. That's a very good thing. 
and uh, about me i am kumar i am currently enrolled in masters in finance program at simon business school i'm i'm going to graduate in this december so i'm actually looking for roles in the quantitative finance hello everyone uh, i am yogesh porichha uh, i graduated from university of maryland in uh, information management and i am very much interested in financial engineering and con finance so i'm trying to switch my field and uh, currently i'm looking for full time roles hi uh, this is uh, all right uh, my name is hamish uh, and i'm pursuing my masters degree in the field of quantitative finance from the rutgers business school i'm currently in my third semester and uh, yeah that's all yeah hey hi uh, thank you so much for your time my name is pranav i am in my third semester of third semester of master in finance at claremont graduate university and will be graduating in december awesome lots of young and and bright people i have now is scared <laughs> anyway so i want this uh, is that all or uh, is there no left Yeah. yeah hello so, i'm uh, surjan kumar hi. and uh, i've just graduated from uh, btech in computer science from uh, vit chennai india great great I'm currently great. looking for uh, full time roles in fund uh, funds yeah shake so there are few people who have joined from india and there are few people who are based out of yes india. yeah now this is this yeah. is great to see yes uh uh, uh yeah i i uh, i uh, i'm really impressed by everyone's like uh, background and and uh, uh, training on the quant finance uh i my focus <laughs> now i'm kind of feeling a little bit uh, uh so my focus uh, of my phd was in numerical analysis so uh, i did uh, improved uh, some of the numerical algorithms for uh by statistics problems and i did a lot of coding there developed the software and ran simulations in supercomputers so i had a background in that also uh, i had a masters before where i did some projects in uh 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 stock market pricing sigma algebra binomial asset pricing models those those so those those projects kind of created an interest in me and uh when i uh, i was uh, uh teaching after finishing my phd um i got this opportunity and i thought like okay so this is the time let's get get into math finance uh so uh i started uh in regions bank 3 years ago and uh a little bit uh, before mehul maybe we kind of started at the same time and uh, i have worked in model validation uh, the 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 function of this department uh, is to validate models uh, developed by bank or used by bank uh uh even uh, uh, the models can be internal it can be external so uh in my in our previous uh, session we, we talked about the process of the model validation uh so uh my area of uh, the models uh, i was validating uh, uh was mainly used for c car c car and c sol process mainly in loss forecasting part so uh i have validated Uh, around five to six models, and these models uh, uh, are kind of important. Uh, I don't know if you if you all know the uh, uh, every bank has kind of a ranking of models. Uh, like different uh, bank uses different formats. Sometimes they call it high, medium, low. Some other banks call it tier one, tier two, tier three. All the seeker and see sold related models they tend to be in the high ranking models because of their uncertainty and also their impact. Uh, in the previous talk, you have seen me also talking about uh, the, uh, the capital planning process uh, and uh, the uh, the uh, the use of stress testing models in there. So uh, these are very important models. uh so that i'm going to start uh, uh, with the definition of loss forecasting models so there are lots of models used by banks so wh- uh, what are the models that we are going to focus on and uh, why they are called loss forecasting models so these uh, models are mathematical models by loss forecasting models we are meaning the mathematical models uh, which predicts uh, credit losses uh, 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 for a predefined forecast period 
you have seen that like in CCAR, uh, you have to predict what, what is your loss going to be in the coming next, uh, say, nine quarters. So for CCAR, you have to predict that and you go each quarter by quarter and you have to predict like in each quarter, uh, uh, what will be the loss in wholesale portfolio, what will be the loss in retail portfolio and all this. So uh, the models used in that process, is, is, uh, it's called the loss forecasting model. And uh, the use of loss forecasting model is similar to the seeker process, like right? So it helps bank with the capital allocation, stress testing uh, and uh, pricing and risk assessment and risk appetite. Uh, uh, by risk appetite, it means like uh, every bank kind of has to choose at some point uh, what kind of risk they're going to take and what kind of like, what is their boundary? Like after that, we're not going to take any more risk. So uh, all this process depends on, on, the, on the projection of these models. Uh, it helps also with the regulatory compliance. Uh, uh, Mehul talked about that in the previous talk, like uh, how, like every bank over 100 billion asset, asset valuation, they are uh, uh, it's mandatory for them to uh, participate in CCAR and DFAST. So uh, it helps with the regulatory compliance. And as I, uh, when I was talking about the definition of loss forecasting models, I was talking about uh, credit defaults. So uh, I guess uh, most of you already know what is a default, like a uh, kind of a uh, uh, general idea, uh, but I was, I, I'll, I'll try, I'll attempt to introduce uh, the kind of technical definitions. Uh, it, it, the main thing is like, it can vary. Like what is a default? It can vary from one model to another. Uh, and then in, by model, uh, they define it. Uh, like in one model, say in mortgage, uh, they will define, uh, say default by one of these four events, like by the de delinquency level, like how long the payment has not been paid by the um, obligor or, or or the borrower, and so, uh, uh, or is there any kind of like a charge off uh, happened? Like uh, uh, I think you guys know charge off, but I'm gonna just uh, uh, add a little bit, like when bank. Uh, or any loan providing institution predicts that like uh, they, they they lose their hope that like we're going to get this money back. They write off those loan or the amount they, uh, uh, the, the borrower owes to them as charge off. That's kind of like, that's how they put it into their balance sheet. Like they have to submit this balance sheet where they have to say how much asset they have and how much. So when they write it as a charge off, it, it goes away from their asset. So if any loan has any charge of events that can trigger the default, also if the obligor has had any bankruptcy. So uh, these are important because uh, uh, for huge data set, you need to kind of like uh, prepare, uh, when you prepare the data set, uh, you need to identify which loan has defaulted and which loan has not, right? Like there is sometimes there, there's no like clear indication, right? So uh, the model sometimes goes through the data set and sees and looks for this kind, these four criteria. Depends on how the model developer designed. Say the design, like if one of these four happens, then we are gonna call that that obligor or that loan has defaulted. So, so that's how uh, kind of the, the default works. Uh, I'm gonna stop there. And as I said, like uh, um, uh, I'm, I want this to be a kind of interactive session uh, and uh, it would help me if you have any questions. So do you have any question on this uh, slide? Yeah, yeah, Sheikh, uh, I have uh, one question. Uh, also, uh, just before that, uh, now, as of now, I, I can see loss forecasting model written. So are you sharing, sharing any other slide? Or are you sh sharing that? Oh, okay. So oh, okay. Oh, okay. This. Oh, okay. At least it popped up in my screen just right. Right. Now. Right. Okay. Sorry. Thanks for kind of saying that. I okay. think it is not updated. I was looking at that, but yeah, let's okay. do this. Uh, so, so uh, I'm sorry about that. I was thinking. So this is the definition here. I was talking about. We are talking about the credit defaults. We are talking about the forecast period and the use is just testing process, uh, the, uh, the use of this, uh, what we need and the necessity and these four uh, kind of criteria to have a default event. Right. 
Also, Sheikh, uh, when do you guys see when I'm kind of uh, working on the screen like this? Yeah. The no, marks? No. yeah, at least now I can see uh, what you just showed right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So do you, do you see my annotation when I'm writing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can see. Yeah. Okay. 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 That's great. Okay. So is there any other question on this? Okay. So, Jake, I have one question. So you mentioned about right. and CCAR and you mentioned about the forecasting period. So is it like for CCAR we take nine quarters and for CCEL we take 13 quarters? Or is there anything like that? Or is it like... Yes, yes. That That's a good question. I'm going to cover that in this <laughs> exactly okay. in the next uh, uh, slide. So that's a good question. Uh, that's a good start. Uh, so uh this uh, this slide i prepared uh, to show why, where the loss curve forecasting model outputs outputs go uh and you can see that one 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 process is seeker and you know that uh and there is another process called seesaw so uh the seesaw if you if you expand that it's it means current expected credit losses and uh it has been adopted it's kind of accounting standard and it defines how do you uh, figure out your SEL. Uh, and uh, uh, just for those who don't know, the SEL is called the allowance for credit losses. And it's, a, it's an important number for banks to figure out for each quarter uh, because this is the amount they have to put aside uh, for any kind of projected losses. So, and they literally put this into a kind of separate account. And they have to figure out uh, what is that amount for each quarter and the forecast. And, and depending on that, they are gonna either add money into that account. I'm just, uh, account is kind of like a metaphor. Uh, they're gonna add money into an uh, account which holds the allowance for credit losses, or they're gonna kind of release some of those as a profit in their balance sheet. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense, yeah. Okay, so uh, CISOL is the process and the economy standard um, uh, to figure out what is the allowance for credit losses. And that depends um, on, on, on the calculation of life of loan loss. So for CISOL, uh, it's kind of technically, you have to project what will be the life of loan loss. Life of loan loss means like, what will be the losses uh, in, in the Uh, can can you all hear Sheikh or is it just me? Yeah, I cannot. I cannot. Sheikh, no. I guess uh, we cannot hear you. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Now we can hear you. Okay. 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 Sorry about that. So uh, why, uh, I'm sorry, this was uh, a little bit tough. Okay, so I was explaining the CISOL process yeah. and how CISOL process uh, 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 helps to identify, uh, figure out the ACL number. And ACL number is the allowance for credit losses. It is the ad addition or summation of all the life of loan loss for each one of the loans. So for C in CISOL, you have to predict what will be the lifelong loss. Right. So for in C car, so if I if you consider just one loan for the C car process, we we try to uh, we 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 project what will be the loss in the next nine quarters, right? So we just project what will be the in quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, and we go until quarter nine, and we add them, and that's for C car, and we, we declare that as that that's the loss for C car process. In the C soul, you have to project what is the loss for that loan. Uh, until it dies. Dies means like until the loan is paid off, right? And it can be long time for say for some, for some loan, like in mortgage loans, like normal mortgage loans can be 30 years long, right? So uh, it's kind of, a, by definition, you have to find the life of loan loss for C, uh, ACL, but uh, it is not possible, right? Uh, with the, all the models we have, you know that like models has limitations. Right, our projection has a limit. We can't predict that long. Like we can't predict what will happen twenty years later, or five, ten years later, or five years later. So 
um, for CISO, what they do is they define one period as uh, which is called a reasonable and supportable period. I don't know if you guys are uh, uh, seeing this. So reasonable and supportable period is a period where the modeling will be applied to predict the losses, okay? So they, uh, for some loans, they decide that like a reasonable and supportable period would be eight quarter. So what does that mean? That means they're gonna use the models to predict what is the loss for this next eight quarters, okay? So then you are gonna say, okay, so uh, how, is, how is that gonna help us to find the life of loan loss? Because we need the loan the loss for the whole life, right? So what they do is they use the model to predict the uh, reasonable and supportable period loss, like this eight quarters, and then they use some kind of scalar, like they multiply they, uh, uh, to multiply that uh, to get the life of loan loss. Now, uh, how do they get these scalars? They try to kind of look at the uh, historical data and uh, try to kind of like do an analysis on the historical data. And they try to see that like, okay, so in say in, in history, what happened if a loan had say $100 million uh, loss in eight quarters, uh, what was the ultimate uh, result when the loan was paid off? Like what was the life of loan? So they look at the historical data and they kind of take an average and uh, of like how, what will be this scalar? Like they, they record the eight quarter loss and life of loan loss in the historical data and they divide by uh, life of loan by eight quarter and they find this factor, which is kind of an average. So, so the story, they don't change it. And then they use the models to predict like what will be the loss in eight quarters. And then they use the scalar to convert it into life of loan loss. That, does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, okay. okay. Yeah, that's interesting to know, yeah. And, and another interesting thing is like this eight quarter is not fixed for CISO. The reasonable and supportable period can be different. It like the model developer is free to choose uh, in the CISO list accounting standard. Um, they give uh, freedom to choose. And what the model developer usually does is they uh, do some analysis. Again, they kind of like do a sensitivity analysis as 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 Mehul presented in the last slide. They they say like, okay, what happens if I consider reasonable and supportable period is seven quarter or nine quarter or ten quarter, and and they, then they produce the outputs and see which one works better, which one is kind of like matching the historical data set more accurately. And then they come with the decision. So uh, it's around eight, uh, eight or nine quarter or 10 quarter. It depends on different model, different banks, but uh, uh, sorry, different banks, I would say. If a bank decides that like the, it, the reasonable and supportable period would be eight quarter, they try to, uh, they have to maintain that all of our models. Otherwise, uh, from board case, you are gonna have one one result and then from home equity, you are gonna have different results. So they try to um, uh, you know, keep it uh, standard among the models within a bank. Also, is there any standard set by regulators for CSL? Like for CCAR, it is like nine quarters. But for CSL, is, is there any standards or any benchmark set by regulators? Uh, for CSL, that's what I'm saying. Like, you're free to choose. Okay. Like, you can choose eight quarter, you can eight nine quarter. So you, you do an analysis on the on the, on the the historical data and see, and we do a sensitivity uh, um, analysis by choosing different lengths okay. uh, for the reasonable supportable period. And you see, like, which one, uh, is uh, giving you more accurate life of loan loss, which is the allowance for credit uh, credit loss. So, so that's the CISO. So, uh, in both cases, seeker and CISO, you see that like we have to predict what is the loss in the upcoming quarters. Like in, in a, either it's eight quarter or nine quarter, we need a uh, uh, we need a projection uh, for next uh, uh, nine quarters. So, but 13 quarter, uh, as, as Meol was saying, is also important outcome that's later uh, in, in terms of like LGD, uh, because uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk more on that, okay? So uh, is there any question here, any more question on CCAR or CSOL? Uh, one last sure. point was, yes, please go Sorry, ahead. Not, not to break your rhythm, but um, I just I was thinking like how it looks like um, when we take that reasonable and supportive period instead of 
um, arbitrary numbers like I understand it's a business edition, maybe six quarters or eight quarters. We take the weighted average maturity of the loan book. So does it make sense to take? Uh, because as you said, like uh, the mortgage loan can include 30 years, but also some of the loans might have been 25, some might be 20. So taking the weighted average time to maturity of the loan book. Weighted average. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yes. There is a uh, there is a method called uh, recall in the document about that warm method weighted average. Uh, I forgot the full full name of this. Uh, there's a, there's a, a way to uh, there's a suggested like federal government like uh, Federal Reserve has some suggested modeling uh, standards. Mm -hmm. One of them is like weighted average. Uh, uh, if I understand you correctly, you are talking about like using weighted average to project these losses, right? Yeah. Is that so true? Let's okay. say the weighted average time to maturity of, of our loan book for a bank loan book is like 13.4 years. Like, because like oh. instead of using scalar, we can just... Okay, okay. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I know, I know. I, I because like now. we don't want to use... So you are talking about the maturity projection yes. and then kind of uh, doing that. But... The, uh, it's not about the maturity of the loan. The thing is like how long your model can predict the losses, right? Like how long in future that is limited. Uh, uh, it, it's not directly tied to the uh, kind of, uh, I, would, I would not say the loan type. Uh, it is tied, it is tied to the uh, predictive power of the model, right? And a kind of uh, uh, in the industry, at least in the banking industry, it's kind of like a well-known that like uh, these models should not be able to predict like more than two years or say uh, three years uh, because the these models depends on the macroeconomic variables, right? Yes. Like these are the inputs of this model as, as Mehul uh, explained in the previous class uh, and macroeconomic variables are also projected, right? Like they come from another model, they project or uh, feds sometimes provide that to us also uh, to provide that feds use their own model to predict those. So you are predicting the microeconomic factors and you're inputting those microeconomic factors in this model and then you're predicting losses. So this whole process has a limitation and kind of uh, all over uh, con uh, like accepted truth is, is uh, uh, combining all this, it's not uh, dependable, like uh, after two or three years, uh, whatever type of loan is that uh, that is. Does that make sense? Yeah, I understood. Because like, especially when you're going, taking a time period of more than two years, the macro economics can vary. So this this does increase the predictive control of PDs too. So it's just more volatile yes. component. So it's going to affect the the value. It's going to fluctuate, fluctuate. So I understand why we yes. go for a shorter period now. This is a great question. Thank you for asking. This is a great question. Uh, uh, another thing I will, uh, at the last point here, uh, I don't know if you can see, uh, that is this scenario, right? Like last, uh, uh, I don't know if you guys remember, uh, uh, Mehul talked about different scenarios, like base scenario, adverse scenario, and severe adverse scenario. Uh, so uh, these are the set of projected inputs for this model, like inputs and macroeconomic variables, right? So uh, how, like, how do we define what is base scenario? How do you define what is severe adverse scenario? I think Mel covered a little bit in that more previous class, so I'm not gonna go into detail, but the main thing is for the CISO, they use the base scenario, like whatever the base projection. Uh, and for Seeker, since it's focused on stress testing, that's another thing. Like, the, what is the main purpose for Seeker? The main purpose is like stress testing. So they consider severe adverse scenario. Like, they want to see. Uh, that's why you are stressing and testing what is going to be the loss, right? So stressing means you are going to the all all the way to the extreme scenario, which is severe adverse. So that's why Seeker uses uh, severe adverse uh, scenario, and CISOL is just. Uh, a normal projection, like it's a, like uh, we are not thinking that the, the, we will have pandemic again in this year. It's just if, if everything goes as it as it is going right now, then what will be a loss? So that's that's the base scenario. So CISOL is kind of dependent on that. Does that make sense? Okay. So yes, please feel free to ask questions. That's uh, that 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 helps. 
uh, me to kind of uh, go off topic and kind of talk uh, a little bit around it. So here, uh, now I'm going to, so you can see C car and C soul, they're both projecting losses at each quarter. It can be eight, nine quarter, like right? So, uh, and what losses of what? Losses of the whole portfolio, right? Like say in banks, like you have two main type of, uh, uh, let me talk about a little bit of portfolio, two main type of division. You have wholesale or business portfolio and you have the retail or consumer portfolio. So in wholesale, you have this big loans, like the commercial, all the commercial loans, big like 1 billion, 5 billion dollar loans. Those are in the wholesale side. Um, the, the main segments are like uh, CRE, like uh, uh, or CNI, those kind of things. And then you have the retailer consumer sector where you have this credit card, you have mortgage, you have home equity, uh, you have auto loans, they, they, they fall in those. So why I'm talking about that? So yes, so for those portfolios, the whole portfolios, you want to project what will be the loss in the next one, two, three, four quarter. So we call that as expected loss. So what is the expected loss in the first quarter? What is the expected loss in the second, third, fourth, fifth, like that? So, and that is calculated by three main factors. Uh, the first one is called EAD, exposure at default. Uh, and the second one is called probability of default. And the third one is loss given default. So what is exposure at default? The exposure at default is like, so, uh, if you look at a loan's history, like it's starting, someone is buying a home, they are getting a like $200,000, $300,000 loan, uh, and they have this fixed amount to pay. So they're paying, 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 and their balance uh, in their loan account is reducing, right? Like the, every month, whatever they're paying, say $800, like $2,000, uh, some of those is uh, is contributing to the interest, and some of those are reducing the principal, right? Uh, so, so that principle is the loan balance. So, as we are going through time, it's reducing, and uh, until it is paid off, right? This loan is paid off, or uh, the loan has defaulted, right? So, now we, 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 uh, when you talk about default, and when you talk about exposure at default, we mean the exposure at default means. What was the loan balance, or what was exposed? How much? How many? How much dollar? How many, you uh, were exposed at the event of default? Like whenever the default happened, what was the loan balance? How much the bank uh, that that borrower owed to bank at that particular moment, right? And it varies, right? Every month he's paying, and and then the balance is kind of reducing. In mortgage, it kind of like predicted, like it goes like really straight line, like fixed amount reduces kind of, but in home equity or credit card, it can be really say, hard to predict, right? Like uh, what will be someone's uh, credit card balance in a particular mat, uh, particular month, it's, it's, it's hard to predict. Even the person who is using is not gonna be uh, accurately uh, able to say like what's gonna be his balance. A particular uh, month. So yes. Yeah. So you know, a, quick, a quick question is: Let's say someone has someone has taken a mortgage of let's say, uh, five hundred thousand dollars, right? And yes, yes. he has paid four hundred thousand dollar, but at four hundred thousand dollar he got defaulted. So the exposure at default is it hundred thousand dollar or is it hundred thousand dollar divided by five hundred thousand dollar? So no, the it's the dollar amount. Okay, it's a dollar. So it's basically it's the dollar amount. It's a it's a dollar. It's it's not a ratio. It's the do exact dollar amount. Like how much dollar was exposed at this event of default. So why they use exposed because it's not, uh, whatever the dollar amount was the balance of that loan. Most of the time, bank don't lose that whole amount. Right. So that's kind of a thing. Even if the loan defaulted, bank has ways to get that money, right? Like they either sell the house or they have some collateral uh, which they can sell or there are different ways to get. So that means expo it is exposed, but it's not been decided that like it's been lost or not. So okay? it's not it's, so, yeah, it is not the final value, but it is, you know, yes. like, what, like what is the exposure to the bank? 
Yes. So, how much dollar is exposed at the event of default? After default, there are a lot of things happens, right? Like after default, uh, either sometime in mortgage and it happens to foreclose, um, some loan uh, holder may say that like, oh, we are bankrupt and all this, a lot of things can happen, right? But after default, uh, there is a period uh, banks are uh, going to charge off some of those defaulted amount. That means they, 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 they are losing the hope of getting it back. Some of the default amount, like uh, EAD, there will be, they will recover some of the money by like selling the house or whatever. So a lot of things going. And that's where the loss given default comes comes in. Okay. So, so loss given default is like, okay, so the default happened and say uh, at default, the loan balance was, as you were saying, 400,000, right? Yeah. Okay. So say uh, they started a loan with 500,000. And when they defaulted, the balance was four hundred thousand. So the four hundred thousand is the EAD. Four hundred thousand dollars is EAD. Now the loss given default, contrast, uh, contrary to the uh, EAD, is a ratio. Like how much of the, how much, what is the percent of EAD actually lost after default? So that is the loan given default. Loan, sorry, loss given default. So that means, given that this loan has law uh, defaulted, what will be the actual loss? So it's kind of a percentage. I'm gonna discuss more in the uh, later part. Uh, so the probability of default is mathematical probability, like how likely a loan uh, is to default in a particular time. This is at, uh, this is related to a particular time. Like at a particular time, what is the probability default of that particular loan? And it varies, it changes. Uh, so we're gonna talk about that. Uh, and uh, uh, so we need these three quantities, EAD, PD, and LGDs. If we can figure out somehow for a particular loan or particular segment, what is the EAD, what is the PD, and what is the LGD, we multiply them and boom, we could we get the total loss. Like what is the loss for this loan in that particular quarter? Does that make sense? Yep, yep. Okay, so in the next uh, one, it will, it will uh, be more clear. So EAD, and as I'm uh, talking about, uh, in, the, in the previous. So it's the exposed amount and EAD is dynamic, right? It's changing over the time. Like you started a, a balance, whatever the loan balance is, like it's exposed. So that's a, it's dynamic. Um, uh, sometimes it's predictable. What will be the EAD? Like if it's a mortgage, I can exactly say uh, 20 years later, what will be the EAD for that loan, right? Like you can just like use the amortization formula to calculate that. So it's, it's easy to uh, uh, predict EAD for some loans. Uh, sometimes it's unpredictable, like the credit cards and the line of credits, like line of credits means like home equity, home equity line of credits. Uh, and do you all know uh, line of credit or should I define it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you could define that would be great. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, so line of credit is uh, almost like credit card, but it's a little bit di uh, different. Like you don't have the card. Another, uh, uh, you have an account, say, uh, the most common example would be home equity line of credit. So say after paying um, some of the principles, right? Like uh, that loan, which started with 500,000. And after a after certain period, it is now the loan balance is 400,000. So that means that borrower has 100,000 equity. Okay, so on that property, he has already gained 100,000 equity. So now they can apply for a loan, which is called the home equity line of credit, HELOC, uh, which is basically uh, a loan acts like a credit card. Like it gives you uh, a certain amount, say the credit card limit, say, say it gives you 50,000, a limit in that loan. Uh, what you can do is like, you can borrow money without any kind of loan application. Like you do it once, so you have applied for a home equity line of credit. They approved 50,000 for it. So that means from now on, anytime you go there, you can withdraw money up to 50,000. And uh, you're gonna pay, when you withdraw some money, you're gonna pay, it depends on different products. Uh, you're gonna pay some interest on that. Um, and uh, you can also pay it back whenever you want. Say you needed to buy something, you, you withdraw 10,000 or you, you needed to remodel your house, you withdraw like 20,000 from the, from that home equity line of credit. You uh, spend that on your home, home remodeling and then you pay it by your 
terms, like you pay 5,000 one month, you pay 10,000 one month, whatever. So that line of credit is gonna is gonna keep a 50,000 uh, allowance for you to take off anytime. And you can you can pay it uh, back uh, anytime you want. It, it works like credit card, but it's like, it, it doesn't have a card, you have to go to the bank or you have to have an account and you, you can withdraw it. So uh, that's a line of credits. I have one question on line of credit. Yes. Yes. So uh, when we are talking about line of credit, are we also considering that uh, the working capital, which is usually given by banks to uh, corporates uh, for their working capital, use of working capital and basis their usage, they are charging it? Is it the same this as... Is a, uh, this, is, uh, this is a great question. Uh, I like that question. So this is not exactly the same. So here you have a house as a collateral. You paid some money, you gained the equity. So you, you have the equity 100,000 and then you are getting 50,000 from there. Uh, the other thing you're talking about, that's a commercial, like for business purpose line of credit. That also uh, that also exists. A lot of loans, uh, business uh, takes those kind of loans. So they, they get a line of credit and they take, withdraw money as they need. They pay their employees they buy products and all this and when they sell things they they put the money back into the account so it's a line of credit but for business purpose and uh the conditions around it is, is it depends on how the bank designed it right so that's what we call the product so some banks can have a different line of credit for small business compared to different another kind of credit for big businesses so uh, it, it differs but the idea is same uh, yeah. And what will be the collateral in those those uh, uh, business line of credits? Uh, uh, completely different than uh, home equity. No, sometimes you don't have maybe collateral. Maybe uh, maybe you just have good relation. You have good credit score. You have a good business. Uh, you don't have collateral. It then can happen. So it depends on the bank. It depends on the how they design that line of credit product. Uh, but that's a really good question. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, so EADs, uh, the main thing, the nice thing uh, is most of the time we don't use modeling. We, we try to predict it through other rule-based system or for mortgage, you don't need any model, right? For mortgage, you can just calculate what will be the EAD. For line of credit, I have seen uh, sometimes they use some kind of like tools uh, which is not like using any kind of regression or something. They look at the, uh, uh, they look at the past history and uh, they try to see what is the pattern, right? Uh, and they, they, they create a rule and then they justify it uh, with the data and, and then they go with it. If you're interested, and there's an interesting example, that is say, I was talking about home, home equity line of credit, right? So, and, and it is kind of, uh, since it's a line of credit, it's hard to predict. People taking money, putting it back and, uh, and, and we don't know like who is gonna draw how much money. Like it depends on people's life situation, all this. Now the question is, what will be the EAD for a home equity line of credit? How are you gonna predict that? Remember, we don't want to use any regression, right? Is it, is it like a, uh, is it a model that you use or without a model? Without a model, <laughs> oh, yes. Why I'm saying that, like, uh, uh, there is a way, and then you can you can bypass the modeling in this part. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm just thinking, like, is it like something? Or uh, because I know, like, there's uh, certain calculations given by the regulators, and uh, the banks can use the same calculation. So, is it something set up by the regulators? That is close. Uh, yes, uh, regulators have some suggested methods and say for PDS also, they have suggested modelings. Uh, the other person was saying uh, weighted average, uh, war models, those are suggested by things. Uh, uh, but I have seen, most of the models I've seen, uh, EADs uh, are not modeled because it's uh, even if it's a line of credit, it's easy to predict. In, you know, like we have the historical data set. That's kind of a frame for us. Like we, we look at that. And uh, and I have seen in some, some uh, in some cases that like they have looked at the 
uh, historical data set, and they have seen that right before default uh, for that particular data set, they have seen that uh, the uses went to 93% or 90%. It's kind of really unusual because if you look at the same data set and if you see average utilization rate, utilization rate means like, say if you have $10,000 limit, how much you are you using, right? Say uh, if you have uh, utilization, uh, utilization rate, 50% uh, means that like most of the people, whatever the limit they have, they are using only 50% of it. But looking at the data set, they have figured out that like, okay, so uh, average utilization rate is 50%, but right before default, uh, this in, at least in this data set, people used around 90%. Oh, so is it like as soon as uh, someone is setting 90% of the utilization rate, it's a, it, they can default because they have a high credits to pay, something like that? It's, it's almost there. It's kind of opposite. Like when they default, before that, they, their usage goes up high. Oh. And the reason behind that is like normally when people uh, fall into financial crisis, they at first uses credit card. And then, then they want to withdraw money from home equity line of credit or HELOCs. And there is a kind of pattern there. So, uh, and they have shown that like there is most of the loans, whichever defaulted, their users went up to 90%. So and those kind of things, like you, you do look at the historical data set and you kind of try to see pattern and they can prove that like, yes, you can confidently say that like, uh, if any loan is gonna go default in this portfolio, they are gonna, their users is gonna go up uh, to close to 90%. And then that's how they decided like, okay, the EAD would be for this portfolio would be 90%. Uh, that was interesting. Uh, I did not kind of pre uh, project that like it, it, it is it is that easy to predict EAD is there. So the main thing is like for EAD is not, we are not going to use modeling. We're gonna focus on PD and LGD. Well, normally people, uh, model PD, uh, PD and LGD uh, by, uh, and set rules for EADs. And probability of default, as, as I told you, that this is a probability. Like if uh, uh, Mehul is taking a loan, uh, the mortgage, uh, 500,000. Uh, Don't say I default. And <laughs> what, is, what is his probability of default in the next quarter? And what is his probability of default in the second quarter, or third quarter, or fourth quarter, something like that? And it it varies. It definitely changes. Uh, uh, and it is a number, right? Like between zero and one, all the probability is a number between zero and one. And uh, uh, how do we predict this? Normally, uh, like in common sense, it ties to people's credit risk, right? Credit risk, they call it credit risk. And the credit risk can be measured in different ways. Like you have the credit FICO score. Uh, there are some other normal things like uh, loan to value ratio. That can be a predictor. Like, uh, does it make sense? Like the name kind of explains loan to value ratio. Like what is your balance and what is your loan? Like what is your home price? Value is the home price and how much balance you have. So LTV, and it also changes over time, right? Like you started with 500,000, so your say, LTV was like 100%, uh, and then when you paid off like 100,000, around say you have uh, 400,000 balance, so that means you have like around 80% uh, LTV now, right? So, so LTV can be a detector, debt to income ratio, um, uh, that can be a predictor for for uh, PD uh, and and also PD can depend on macroeconomic factor. So all these predictors, uh, we, we classify them in big two types. One is shared by all the borrowers, like the macroeconomic factors, right? So whatever happening in the economy, that's affecting everyone. So unemployment rate, uh, consumer price index, the inflation affecting everyone. Uh, uh, then uh, treasury rate, uh, the interest rate, that's going to affect everyone. So those kind of things are shared by everyone, and we call them as like systematic factors. And this FICO score, LTV, we call it we call it idiosyncratic factors. 
these are tied to a particular borrower. Uh, and I want you to kind of uh, recognize this difference, big difference, because uh, some of the models are not going to use any kind of uh, idiosyncratic factors because that's not, not possible. It depends. Like uh, when you're doing modeling, uh, you have to kind of uh, balance like how much complex you want to make the model, uh, how much simplicity you want, what is the cost. Like you can go, you can make it very granular. Like you can you can predict the loss uh, uh, borrower by borrower, right? Uh, also, you can predict the loss for the whole segment. So there are two things. So if you go borrower by borrower, that that's gonna be costly, right? Mm -hmm. So a bank might have lots of loans, right? Like maybe uh, one hundred thousand or or maybe two hundred thousand loans. So your model has to go through each borrower, look at everyone, each one separately, their FICO scores, their DTI, their LTVs, and then also the prediction will work there loan by loan. And it can be costly, it can be long-term. Uh, uh, compared to that, if you have a segment level model where you are predicting the whole, uh, the loss for the whole segment, the loss for the whole wholesale segment, so, that happens too. So In that, that case, the cost would be less. Yes. Uh, so when you say segment, uh, is it like segment based on what? Is it on based on the income or is it based on the loan, the loan amount? So what what is it based on? Yes, that is a good question. Uh, uh, segments can base can based on different things. Uh, uh, it depends on what you are trying to predict. Like say for LGD. For LGD models, people try to say make segments based on collateral type. Like collateral means like uh, for a mortgage, the collateral would be the house, right? Like if something wrong happens, bank can come and get your house, right? So uh, for LGD, that makes sense because the loss given default, but when the default happens, how much loss you are gonna face or how much recovery you're gonna have, that depends directly on your collateral. If you don't have any collateral or your collateral is not saleable easily or different things have, have been there, then it will affect your LGD directly. So that's one thing. Uh, for PD, it can be it can be other, other things, um, uh, business types, um, uh, uh, industry type can be a segment. So uh, uh, for wholesale, uh, they use, uh, say, industry type on a lot of time, like I was talking about uh, commercial real CRE. Like in wholesale, there are two big things like CRE and CNI. CRE is commercial real estate and CNI is commercial and industrial. Uh, does that answer your question now? Right, right. Yeah, that, that definitely answers my question. So let's, yes. say, so, so let's say if we have a mortgage portfolio right and we, yeah. we are trying to predict the pd and as you said let's say we, the bank has 200 you know any any bank has let's say two hundred thousand dollar, right so yeah. and you said this whole uh you know going for each let's say building this model for each borrower will be you know computationally intensive and costly at the same time yeah. so yeah. so in in this specific case let's say in mortgage case is it so? What exactly will you look at for PD? Is it is it the amount like when you segment the model for when you segment the mortgage model? What exactly okay. do you look at? Uh, you do have to look at your data set and do just kind of uh, uh, you, you need to you need to look at your data set and you have to see if there is a uniformity. Oh. Uh, uniformity means. Uh, uh, if the whole mortgage segment, all those loans, uh, uh, that's why it's not all of the math always. You have to know the uh, what kind of people are in your mortgage portfolio, right? Are they single family home? And this is, if that's that single family home, that will be something different than uh, say landowners, just landowners or say office owners. Uh, say someone bought a property and they uh, rent it as an office. So that's gonna play differently than someone bought a house and living in there, right? Okay. So 
there are there are different uh, there are there are difference may, based on owner occupied versus non uh, owner non occupied like for in commercial uh, 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 loans like some of the uh, property is occupied by the owner like owner lives there and has the business there so that uh, uh, th those loans behave differently than uh, uh, something else also in the real estate portfolio there is income producing real estates versus non like not that like income producing real estates like people buy just houses to just get an extra income right like you have some money you buy invest that to buy the house again so so there are different things uh, you can make segments on so you have to look at the look at the data set and you have to you have to create segments different on different types and you have to test like okay so uh, if I if I create a segment based on income producing versus income not producing, are they showing any kind of pattern? Like, is there a sharp contrast between income producing versus income non producing? Are the probability of defaults uh, for income producing is way different than the other ones? So you you kind of like separate them in different segments and see uh, if there's uniformity of difference. Does that make sense? Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Thanks, thanks, Sheikh. Uh, that is a really good question. Thanks, man. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, we talked about PDE there, uh, and then the loss given default. I, I talked about that a little bit before. Uh, so loss given default is you're trying to predict how much uh, the percentage of your EAD. What is the percent of percentage of your EAD is actually gonna get lost? Like bank is gonna lose it. Right. So for the mortgage example, it was like we had five hundred. We started with the five hundred thousand. At the time of default, one hundred thousand was paid. Right. Now you have four hundred thousand. Uh, the loan balance. So EAD is four hundred thousand. And the uh, bank took the uh, bank took the house. The bank is trying to sell it. Uh, and during this process, bank is losing some money. Maybe there is the lawyer cost. Maybe there is like the house price depreciated or something happened. Uh, well, I don't know. Let's say they could not recover all those 400,000. Maybe they recovered only 300,000. So in that case, uh, your LGD is 75% because your EAD was 400,000 and you recovered. Sorry, I, I, I made a mistake. So your EAD was 400,000 and you recovered 300,000, so you lost 100,000. So that means your LGD is 25%. Does that make sense? Yeah, so it's basically 100,000 divided by 400,000. 400,000, yes. So the total loss over the EAD. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So, so, if, so, so that, this is the thing we're trying to predict. And uh, there is a little bit uh, uh, details in there. Sometimes by loss, what are the meaning? Uh, it can be gross loss versus net loss. Uh, gross loss is uh, just char um, charge offs, and net loss is is a charge of minus recovery. Charge off means like what bank thought that they're gonna lose, uh, but then recovered something back. So if you get the subtraction, then you get the net loss. So this is the net loss. Sometimes they just predict this guy and they say that this is the loss. So it can be a little bit different, but the idea is there that like, if the default happens, how much uh, you are gonna actually lose. So this is also, again, your percentage. So it varies between zero and one, uh, and we use modeling to predict this. And uh, as I told before, it depends, a lot of time it directly depends on the collateral type. Okay, any question, any, any other question on LGD? Yes, so um, the cost include the labor cost also, like or if the loan is being given to the third party, they they will do it for you. So that includes some commission to the given to the third party. So the cost include that. So uh, let me uh, just uh, try to see if I understood you. Uh, you're talking about some collection part. Yeah, yeah right? collection. Sometimes, cost, yeah. Uh, sometimes say a loan defaulted. Uh, this is a good question. Though. Um, or, or you know, someone defaulted and then sometimes bank uh, transfer this to a collection party. They go there, they try to recover the money and they have a bill. Sometimes they have a bill or they cut 
they make the profit from the amounts recovered, whatever that is. Yes, that will that will be under under the charge of like whatever the loss is there. That the, the payment that collection company is getting from the bank or the profit they're getting, or however it is working. So that will be that that's that's kind of loss from the bank, right? The bank didn't get that money. So you subtract that from EAD and then you, you yeah, as a loss. Yeah. Okay, so uh, then uh, I'm going to talk about the methodologies used to predict PD and LGD. Uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, methods like uh, for PD LGD. Also, as I as I said a little bit before, that uh, it at the end it depends on uh, how much effort you are putting there to predict your PD or LGD, right? Like you can you can use. Uh, really fancy methods uh, in go loan by loan, predict loan by loan, and do those things uh, very granular uh, and try to be more accurate. Sometimes that doesn't mean you are going to be accurate, uh, but sometimes you can be just made a simpler method. So for pretty, we have uh, two main types. Uh, uh, we have the transition matrix uh, in model, uh, which also uses a fractional uh, probability regression. Or log integration, uh, and there is another method use, which uses survival analysis. Uh, it's sometimes they call this hazard model uh, that also uses logistic regression with it. So these are two kind of main types. There are a few other types. I'm not going. Uh, if I get in a chance in future, uh, I'm going to talk about survival analysis at one point. But today's uh, episode. Uh, I will try to cover transition matrix and let's see how, how far I can go. Uh, so for PD, those are the two main types. And for LGD, uh, if, uh, predicting LGD is a little bit easier than PD because a, a PD, is some, PD is kind of related to other stuff. Like it's not uh, just uh, uh, happened randomly. Uh, someone before defaulting uh, their credit rolls uh, ratings uh, go down uh, at first. Uh, they slowly, their credit score goes down. A lot of things happen. So there are like a lot of dynamic going on. So you can capture those things uh, by transition matrix. I'll show how, how we do that. Uh, and then you can make your projection much more accurate uh, by capturing those characteristics, uh, which happens around the default event. Uh, for LGD, uh, it's just a percentage. Um, it's 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 modeled uh, pretty straightforward. Like you you look at your historical data, you see that like okay, in, in my time horizon say starts from two thousand seven to this. You look at the historical data, you see like oh, wh what happened into the quarter one of two thousand seven. You look in your data set and you see that like okay, so. The, the loans defaulted in quarter one of 2007, uh, how much money we recovered on those loans, right? And then you subtract it, or how much money we lost, we, we lost on those loans. And then you calculate the LGDs for each one of those default events in that quarter, right? And then you take an average and you can say that like, okay, so for quarter one of 2007, uh, our average LGD was, uh, 10%, okay, or, or, or 25%, whatever that number is. So that's how you create a time series. At 2007, quarter one, you have this, then quarter two, quarter three, until you come to like 2024, right? You have you have uh, LGDs, average LGDs uh, for each one of this quarter, and that creates a, a time series, and you can use logistic regression fractional logic uh, to to, to predict that, and that's kind of straightforward. Uh, any question on that? So, uh, so, sorry, please go ahead. Okay, so uh, yes. can we use uh, the historical data for uh, recovery rate as an uh, proxy to calculate the loss given default? And if we can use it, uh, can we use it as a ch changing percentage means uh, whether the recovery rate is changing from 80% uh, to 90%? Can we that factor into the model? 
Yes, yes. By recovery rate, actually the recovery rate, say, let me try to see, the recovery rate. Uh, so if you if you subtract that from one, that will be your LGD. Do you see my writing on the screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. So uh, yes, you can predict the uh, recovery rate. You can model it, and then you predict your recovery rates for the future quarters, and mm -hmm. then you subtract it from one, and then you can LGD. You can do it that way, or you can mm -hmm. directly predict just LGDs. Okay. Because remember, in the in the in the uh, loss calculation, you need the LGDs. Yes. So you can do it in both ways, but if you predict LGDs directly, uh, you, a number of states in your calculation will be reduced. Does that make yes. sense? Understood. Yeah. But uh, I would say in some models they do it that way, the way you're saying. Okay. They 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 calculate uh, uh, recovery rates. Uh, in which models? I've seen that say the models where they projected the charge of, right? Okay. Instead of the loss. Uh -huh. So uh, so now you need a recovery rate to get the loss. Yes. So if you just project this, a charge of that kind of similar mm -hmm. thing like that. So then you need to project your recovery rate too. And then uh, without these two, you're not gonna get LGD. Yes. So in the some models I've seen that doing uh, doing that way. Uh, it depends on how whatever your data set is, um, how clean it is, and, and in which way it makes sense. Mm -hmm. But it's rare. Projecting yeah. LGD directly is kind of more common. Okay, so uh -huh. so I, I try to, yes. Uh, Sheikh, I have just question. And so you you right. mentioned, you mentioned about uh, we we uh, you know from the historical data set we basically check like quarter on quarter, uh, you know what what is the loss. So let's say quarter one, 2007, we saw, let's say, a 10% loss or let's say a 40% loss. And we have a time series from quarter one, 20, uh, 2007 to, let's say, quarter two, 2024. Now, let's say, talking about C cell, right? We need to predict the losses for next uh, next eight quarters, right? So how would you, how would we do that? Uh, is it like taking the average of last eight quarters or... No, that that's where uh, you say you have a uh, you have a, this equation, right? And your y i here, this is the logic regression, okay? Right, uh, and 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 your y i is the LDD. Okay. Uh, so you are using the regression to predict the LDD for the future quarters, right? Okay. So for free. For those eight quarters, for each one of those eight quarters, you are projecting your LGDs, you are projecting your PDs for each quarter, you are projecting uh, EADs too for each one of those quarter, right? right? And then for at each quarter, you you are multiplying those three. Okay. So there will be say EAD one, then EAD two, EAD three, like for each quarter. And then PD, there will be PD one for first quarter, PD two for second quarter, PD three. Does, it, does that make sense in that way? Yeah, yeah. And then LGD for those. And in each quarter, you're gonna multiply say EAD one times PD one times LGD one. And that's gonna give you the loss, expected loss for quarter one. Okay. Okay. Understand. Does it make sense? Yep. Okay. So uh, now that's a good question. And again, uh, in LGD uh, modeling, you can you can do it by segment by segment. Uh, when I was describing average, uh, it's kind of a segment level prediction. So you are taking uh, say you have a particular segment in a wholesale portfolio, a particular segment is a CRE. So uh, in that segment, you are looking at all the loans and you're seeing uh, which loans has defaulted, right? So you are seeing those loans and then you're taking average of each one of those loans LGDs. And you're saying that like, okay, for CRE, for that quarter, that is the loan. So that's a kind of like a segment level prediction. But you can do it by also loan by loan. Uh, the, the benefit of doing loan by loan is like now you can include some of the borrower level 
uh, variables, right? Like you can include uh, credit score in there, or you can include say LTV there, which is possible when you do loan by loan. So this is kind of like two main types, like loan level prediction versus segment level prediction. So let's simplify it. Say, say here, uh, you can see, I, I tried to show a story about the quality of drawing there. It's not, no. it's not, I'm not good at drawing. So uh, here, what I tried to show is like, say your historical data is this black, okay? So, and it can be LGD, it can be PD, it was this at the beginning, and then the, uh, it followed this uh, this path, this path uh, until this point. Here is the current time. So this is the uh, uh, now. Now uh, you built your model, and uh, you have uh, used that model, kind of a back testing, to see uh, what was the. LGD at, that, at this point, what is the LGD at this point? And that created, say, this uh, blue line. So this is the pro predicted. The, this, this blue line came from your model. And the black line is the actual, uh, actual uh, value. And at this point, you are trying to project what will be the LGD in, in the coming quarters, like what will be here, what will be here and what will be here, right? And for projecting, now these three colors represent different scenarios. Like the green one represents the base scenario and the yellow one represents the adverse scenario. And for the severe adverse, you can see that this red one. And you can see that for the severe adverse, it's really high. So that means uh, the LGD is really high in severe adverse scenario. That, that should be the... Uh, expected, right? Like severe adversity, really something bad is going on. So that LGD is really high. So, so th this is how it works. Like uh, you, 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 you get the macroeconomic factors, you have your loan level values and you can project these three things. So baseline, base looks like that and uh, adverse looks like that and severe adverse looks like that. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, I just have one question on the macroeconomic variables. So, for, yes. so let's say, uh, do you like, um, so I remember at least uh, when I was building models for CCAR, we used to, we used to take either monthly variables, economic variables or quarterly economic variables. But let's say in the case of C cell, right, you mentioned about treasury rates, right? So treasury rates are daily, you know, you get daily rates. Uh, so is it, is it like we can use daily data, monthly data, quarterly data, or is or is it something like oh you just can use monthly data and quarterly like how is it like you can use any economic variable for that matter? Uh, that's a really good question. First of all, the okay. second thing is uh, it uh, mostly depends on the available data set, right? So uh, I have seen that like for some models you have the monthly data. Right. Now you have a choice when you have monthly data you can you, you can use your time points as monthly for training, also for predicting. Mm -hmm. uh, also, you can kind of like consolidate that like three months together and then create a quarterly data. Right. Does that make sense? Right, right. right? So you can, you, can, you, can, you can convert the monthly data into quarterly if you want. Uh, uh, so the projections normally works is like this. You saw that like CCAR or CISOL, they go quarter by quarter. Like you have this ACL for one quarter like you need final prediction for one like quarter by quarter right. so now you have a quarterly data you don't have choice you just do it quarterly you have if you have monthly data you can either do it monthly and then consolidate the, those uh, as quarterly data uh, you can add, add those by average those for quarter and then you do it that way uh, but it depends on uh, uh, what is the granularity? We call it granularity. Like, like, uh, do you have monthly or quarterly? If you have monthly, uh, uh, if uh, if you want to train a train and project in monthly system, does that goes uh, like what is the cost of that? If you keep it monthly, like the calculation cost, the uh, analysis cost, and also does it go with your methodology? Like the methodology you're choosing. Right, so 
there are several factors and you know, usually developers make a decision uh, either they keep it monthly or keep it quarterly. So the um, uh, uh, so I have seen both of them. If that answers the questions. Yeah, definitely. So that's a good question. So also sometimes it's not that complicated. They don't use uh, regression at all. Like you, there's one version. This is uh, from this paper. Uh, you guys can figure out. Uh, this is the reference. Uh, uh, there, uh, uh, LGD is modeled as a function of PD. If you look at the right hand side, you can see that like here you have some constant A0, A1, A2, uh, and then uh, you have a variable called PD. So that means they're saying if you know PD, uh, then you can get LDD by just as a function. Uh, you don't have to go through regression. Uh, you don't have to uh, do all this analysis. You can just calculate LDD as a function of PD. Uh, so that was proposed in this paper. Uh, this is Gaze Good. Gies, we call Gies, his name. He is a Swedish researcher. Uh, and uh, this is great. Uh, even though this is a, like a nonlinear function, if you, have, you guys have noticed that there's a power in PD and this A1 can be anything like two, three, four, 45, anything. So that means it's a nonlinear function. So uh, you do a nonlinear fit in SAS or whatever software you're using and you figure out what is this coefficients and then boom, and then you can get the LGD. But the condition is you have to know what is PD, right? So, so that's, the, that's the caveat of this method. So if you're confident your PD is calculated really nice and you're, you, you have a strong confidence on that, then you can go for this. Uh, and then you can just like calculate LGD as a function of PD. Does that make sense? Yep, yep. Okay, so there are different ways. I'm just showing that like regression can be used also a nonlinear uh, function can be used like that. So uh, with that, I was curious uh, if everyone is tired, <laughs> like I'm talking a lot and anyone needs any break. I can, I, I mean, I am, I'm not even in the 50% uh, of my slide. Okay. But I'm going to just stop there and give a break and be, uh, let us people ask questions and see uh, how it's going. So, so maybe what we can do is if if you if you all agree, we can take a five minute short break and then we can continue and maybe I can pause the recording. Does that sound good to everyone? Yeah, man. Uh, yeah. 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 Thanks for coming back. So this last portion, we are going to focus on summarizing what the slides or what the talks we have so far. It's been long, like uh, more than one and a half hour. So a uh, summary would be better. So uh, that we started to uh, we started with loss forecasting models, like why, why uh, what is it, and uh, uh, we we talked about uh, uh, the forecast of credit losses. So the loss forecasting models does the forecast for credit losses. And then we talked about uh, why do banks need it? Uh, we mentioned some of the things from the previous talk, uh, kind of the stress testing models, uh, necessarily the same thing. Uh, so we use it for capital allocation uh, pricing. By pricing, we mean sometimes like uh, say loan pricing or, or the, what is the interest and all the stuff. So uh, uh, you make your loss projection and you try to, that affects the pricing of loans. Uh, then risk assessment, uh, also these loss projections helps you to understand which portfolio is more risky than the other ones, right? Like you know, higher loss means like this, that portion is, so it, it works as a risk assessment too. Um, it helps banks uh, to decide, uh, to figure out the risk appetite. Uh, and then we talked about the default. Um, uh, it can be different for different models and how do we define it? Uh, uh, some of the most common factors are delinquency level, uh, uh, foreclosure, charge off and bankruptcy. Do you guys any, have any, any question about the default? Like is the delinquency level clear to everyone? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So, 
thank you. So um, uh, after defining things, we went to discuss more on seeker and seesaw process. Uh, we talked about their length. Uh, we discussed more on on seesaw. Uh, we discussed on the idea that seesaw's predic prediction length can be variable. It's called reasonable and supportable period. Uh, the ACL uh, estimate depends on life of loan loss. Uh, and that is done by predicting the loss for a uh, reasonable and supportable period. And then uh, sometimes uh, factoring it to the life of loan loss, uh, there is sometimes uh, uh, another method which I have missed first time. Can I talk about that a little more? There's another way to convert from uh, uh, reasonable and supportable period to life of loan loss. Oh, that's great. Then let me talk about that. So let me add a phase here. So. So now this thing called, uh, we are going to need an idea called through the cycle, TTC. Have you guys ever seen that? Um, I guess I've heard about uh, PIT, which is point in time. PIT and cycle. point in time. Uh, PIT and TTC. Cycle. TTC is through the cycle. So uh, we need that idea because say, again, I'm, I'm trying to, draw a line. So you are calculating the losses. So this is the start of your time. This way you have time and this way you have expected losses. And say uh, from time zero to say certain point, uh, you have this historical data, your loss is going up and down and down and up and say something like that here at the current time. is equal to say the current time C. So at this point, uh, you want to project the life of loan loss. We call it as LOL, -L, life of loan loss. Uh, uh, and to do that, we project say for a reasonable and supportive period. So here we have a, so this is the current time. Uh, let me extend it a little more. I'm not good at drawing. Bear with me, please. <laughs> okay, so let me extend it a little bit. I need more space. So at this point, say your reasonable and supportable period is say here. Then you have eight quarters. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, right? So this is your forecast. Uh, for, so this period is your forecast horizon, this, this jump. Uh, this is where you are sitting right now. And this is your historical period. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, so now you are making the loss and you are making a projection for loss at each one of these future quarters. We are talking about CSOL process. We are talking about ACL estimate, right? The ACL is the allowance for credit losses. So uh, now uh, to get the life of loan loss, uh, you start with this reasonable supply period and say you get some values here, say at this quarter you have this, uh, say you get a line like say, like this, okay? Well, let me redraw it, sorry. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, so uh, uh, 
say our projection uh, from the model for this eight period. This is reasonable and supportable period. And our projection is say, like this. So now we have this projection, then what will be the losses for the next quarters? That's the question, right? So uh, for the next quarters, what they do is like they use a mean reversion process. So what is mean reversion? So they, see, they say that like, okay, uh, we are going to figure out a number called uh, the through the cycle loss. So through the cycle loss, that means like if, uh, if you have a full business cycle in your historical data set, so what is a full business cycle? Uh, uh, I guess you have some idea. Um, so <laughs> yeah, I mean, through the cycle, I guess it's more of, okay, I guess for, um, it's for the complete period, right? I mean, for the whole horizon. Yes. We we do come we do compute through the cycle. Yes, uh, that is correct. That is correct. So uh, one condition is like for the complete period, but you have to make sure that like you have a full business cycle, and the business cycle is like you have ups and downs, right? Say uh, in if in if in your time horizon, this is very important. In, in your time horizon, if you don't have uh, a severe loss in your time horizon means like in, in your training data set you don't have severe loss. Mm -hmm. they, we know that for an example we know that uh, uh, great recession happened 2007 and eight right so mm -hmm. if your time horizon says start from 2004 and it comes until now that means in your training data set you have an extreme recession period which is 2007 and eight, right? But say you're working with some model and the model's training data set starts at 2010 or say 2012. In that case, your training data set does not have a full business cycle because from if you start from 2012, there is a slow recovery and the pandemic is not, I wouldn't say it's as extreme as great recession in 2007-8. So through the cycle means like, if you have a time horizon or training data set which has a, a full business cycle, a recession, recovery, and all of this, then if you take an average of a loss in that time horizon, that will be your through the cycle loss. Does that make sense? Say, for 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 this example, say we our data set starts at say two thousand four, and say this is twenty twenty four. Okay, so that means we have a recession. My curve should be different a little bit here. Sorry, in the recession, the loss uh, the loss should be way higher. Say this is the period where you have 2007, 2008. And you can see that like this is really high there. So uh, so if our, the main thing is like if our data set starts at 2004, that means we have a, a huge a recessionary period there and then the recovery thing uh, where loss is coming down. Uh, and maybe uh, in pandemic it went up or something. So that means our data set has a full business cycle. So now if we take an average there, then that will give us uh, average, uh, 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 like the TTC or through the cycle average of loss. And that will be something like the average would be like, be like, 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 like that. So say so this line is representing the TTC loss, like through the cycle loss. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this like this is, up... this is just, yeah. Sorry. So this line goes up till where, like, is it like till, till the end of the loan? Uh, 
So this is the average, yes, like this is through the cycle. Well, say in the next year, your through the cycle may change because say your data sets horizon uh, extended a little bit, right? In that case, this is just an average. So it, it can go up or down a little bit. Does that make sense? Yeah. So uh, through the cycle is the average in your whole time horizon, given that your time horizon has a full business cycle. So now uh, we were talking about how do they calculate life of loan loss? So we know that sitting at here, like we are sitting at here, we're trying to get the loss for the whole life. So the loss for the whole life, to get the loss for the whole life, we add loss from here, 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 like at each one of this quarter, we know what is the loss. We add all of them and then we should get the uh, life of loan loss. But the problem is we have the projection until this point, but we don't know what is happening here. Does that make sense? After the reasonable and supportable period, right? Mm -hmm. So what they do is uh, they use the model to predict this part. And then they use a process called mean reversion process. It's a Ornheister process. Uh, uh, I think they use it in, in, in uh, VR models too, like stock pricing models, they use those winner process. Uh, so basically what happens is like, it slowly goes back to, they project that like it will slowly go back to the through the cycle rate. Like uh, uh, now that the question is like, how quickly they go back, like they go back like this, or they go back to through the cycle rate like this, or they go back to, to through the cycle like this. That is also kind of a choice. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the detail, but the thing is they use the mean regression process to uh, to start, uh, start at the end of the uh, reasonable and supportable period here, and then make a projection uh, where they consider like after a certain period, the loss rate will, will reach this through the cycle rate. So after a while, the loss rate will be Averages of the whole through the through the cycle. Does that make sense? Right. So that's how they get the rest of it. Like they say that, like okay, uh, let me use uh, yeah. Let's just use the blue line. So uh, they project that it will go to the through the cycle like this, and then they it will continue like that, and then. Uh, they add the losses of all of it until the loan dies off, right? And then that's how they get uh, the life of loan loss. Okay. So they add the loss here, 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 and the loss, this, 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 this. All of these losses added uh, to get your life of loan loss. And that's one process here. They're using the mean reversion process from here to go back to the through the cycle rate. Uh, uh, and uh, this is another process which is much more accurate than just uh, multiplying the reasonable and supportable figure to get uh, the loss on life of loan loss. Yeah. So basically, there are two approaches. One can be okay, let's focus for eight quarters. And then depending on the historical data, you set a scalar and then you basically yes, scalar, yes, scalar yes, with, yes. with that uh, eight eight quarter eight quarter uh, losses. So that is the first approach. And second is using so you are predicting the eight quarter and then afterwards mean, you you apply a mean reversion model. Mean reversion process, yes. Okay, okay. The mean reversion happens here after the reasonable and supportive period. And basically it shows, it gives you a path to go back to the through the cycle rate, which mm. is this red line, okay. which is just the average in your historical data set. Okay. Okay, so this is one way of uh, calculating the life of loan loss. Uh, then you talked about the uh, loss forecasting main components of the loss process like how do, uh, you know, like EAD, PD, and LDD, we have defined that. Uh, and uh, uh, thanks for some questions there. Uh, it is 
uh, EAD is a dollar value, PD is a, is a number between zero and one, LGD is also a number between zero and one. Basically, this is a probability of default, and this is like if the default happens, uh, the percentage of loss uh, compared to the EAD. So you know, we predict these things and we can multiply them to have expected loss. So expected loss of say uh, for each quarter at there, your expected loss is this, at there your expected loss is this, at there your expected loss is this, and then you add these numbers all together to get the nine quarter loss, sorry, nine quarter loss for the for the CISO and the eight quarter, sorry, the life of loan loss for the CISO. The it, sorry, I mean, nine quarter loss for the seeker and life of loan loss for the CISO. Okay. Getting, <laughs> getting late. <laughs> anyway, so uh, any question on that? Uh, so I have a question about the data set that the bank uses to predict the the expected loss and all the two factors. So if the bank is a new, like uh, recent, yeah. they have started the banking services. So what kind of data that they use, like if the bank is old, so they have the database, uh, then their personal database of the loans and all. But what if the bank is new? And what kind of data set they refer to, um, like to predict the expected loss or uh, loss given default? That is a very important question. Thanks for asking that. Um, I'm really glad everyone is asking really nice questions. Uh, uh, yes, uh, it's, uh, sometimes you don't even have to be a new bank. Even old banks might have uh, very low quality data set. Like, uh, say you have a wholesale portfolio. Say you have uh, in the wholesale, uh, you have loans. That most of your loan never defaulted, right? Like it can happen. So that means in your in your training data set, if you have zero loans for a lot of quarter, right? Sorry, zero loss for a lot of quarters. Right. If that happens, that means even if you're old bank. Uh, like you, you are very careful. It depends. It, this thing depends on a lot of things. It depends on your loan officer, like or your policy banks is taking, like how much liberal they are to give the loan and how much careful they are by choosing the borrowers, right? So if you're very careful, your borrowers will be good, and then you are not going to have that many defaulting your training data set. And if your training data set doesn't have enough default or enough events you're trying to predict, then this model is not gonna work, even if you have a longer time horizon. So uh, it happens for new banks, definitely. They, if What if they don't have the full business cycle as shown there, right? Like they had the bank started at say uh, 2015. They're not gonna have the data from 2007 or eight. Uh, and if they want to use internal data, they are not going to uh, have a, a full cycle for the TTC uh, TTC numbers, the through the cycle numbers. So in those cases, they, uh, there are different ways to do. Uh, 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 I have seen they use um, external data set. Uh, they can come from some established uh, data set provider like Moody's, uh is a good name right Meho? Meho knows more than oh so, yeah i can that. yeah i can i can maybe add something on that so if you see c yeah. car uh, yeah jay like if you see c car uh the i guess one of the uh, one of the condition for c car is that the bank should be mid-size or a large bank uh so yeah. let's say it is less than 100 billion dollar there's a threshold to it so if that is the case, then uh, you know you don't need to perform CCAR in general. So you don't need to forecast uh, any losses for let's say next uh, nine quarters. So you know to your question, let's say if it's a new if it's a new bank. So for new bank CCAR generally does not apply. And once the bank reaches the hundred billion dollar limit, uh, and once you know hundred billion dollar, you know 
as soon as the bank reaches it's it actually becomes a you know a mid-sized bank so and then yeah. they have of course uh, to reach 100 billion dollar you know it takes time so so i think like uh uh, for a new bank, uh, yeah, CSL becomes challenging because again, it's PD, LGD, and EAD, and with no historical data, uh, it becomes tough to predict, uh, predict the you know default or not. But at least for CCAR, I can say it, uh, it only works for you know there's a threshold to the uh size of the bank. Yeah, 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 yeah. yes. Uh, that 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 is yeah. You remind me another thing about CSL is kind of current. So uh, current expected losses. Uh, so there is some uh, difference in accounting, uh, like what are you considering as loss versus, that's why like the sharp contrast, like CISOL requires life of loan, like whole full loss in the full life cycle of the loan, right? Versus CCAR only cares about what is happening in ninth quarter. So this kind of differences. And again, come back to like, what, what if they don't have uh, and of the internal data, so they can uh, they can buy or get buy data from data providing uh, organizations like Moody's. Moody normally provides ratings, so they have access to uh, the uh, internal data of a lot of organizations, and they can provide data set uh, uh, which is dependable. Uh, sometimes uh, bank and or institute can use a peer data like they will see, okay, so what are the banks here, which is similar size to our bank? Uh, and they, uh, if the data set they need is publicly available, right? Like you, you don't have data, you, you don't have access to the data set, internal data set of another bank, but banks publish a lot of information to their uh, yearly reports like 10Q uh, and, uh, and those stuff. So if you can collect data, uh, from your peer banks and like that, you can depend on those data. Uh, 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 those are the two main sources coming to my mind, but yes, then you use external data set. Yeah, that's, that, that answers my question. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really good question. Uh, so uh, then we, we talked about ED, uh, PD and LGD, uh, more details on that. Then we talked about normal methodologies used for PD and LGD. And then we talked about uh, the regression uh, and the use of um, sometimes a nonlinear function. Uh, uh, and in the next class, uh, our idea would be to talk about transition matrix, uh, uh, which helps to predict the PDs. And we're gonna talk about how, uh, uh, what it represents and how do we predict transition metrics and how do we use transition metrics to predict uh, probability of defaults. I'm gonna stop there, it's 11 um, uh, here. Uh, so uh, it is really nice to uh, get a chance to be uh, a part of this process uh, when we started and I really enjoyed uh, the most, the most thing I enjoyed here is the question. That was a nice question, really thoughtful questions. And thanks for uh, participation. Sure, sure, Sheikh, thank you so much. Maybe I'll just stop the recording and then maybe we all can chat. Yeah.